No Enemy But Peace was an indie comic produced back in 2012 by Richard C. Mayer, better known as Diversity in Comics. The story was based on the true exploits of one Sergeant Marco Martinez during his first fight in Iraq, and judging by the description, it's clear that there's a lot more behind this comic than pure entertainment. The story of Sergeant Marco Martinez is one of bravery and valor, a one-time gangbanger who, because of these events, earned the Navy Cross. But more than that, Mayer felt this story needed to be told, because no one else was going to tell it. Oh sure, the Marines would know, the politicians would know, and his family would know, but no one else ever would. This was a small battle that ultimately changed nothing concerning the war. However, No Enemy But Peace was never really a war story. This was a story about a person, and how this small tale of loyalty and determination out in the middle of the desert changed one man from a soldier into a real life superhero. And how this comic represents Mare's quest to prevent this story from being lost to time. Now, why did I mention all that? Because six years later, Rich Johnston, the writer and founder of Bleeding Cool, and more recently, the Igor, to Mark Wade's bigger, uglier Igor, decided to use the title of the comic in the title of a hit piece called No Enemy But Peace, Richard Mayer, Antarctic Press, and Jawbreakers, but never actually describes the work anywhere in the article. Johnston's choice to include the work, but not describe it, represents the core reason why this article is far from a work of professional journalism and much closer to a work of professional propaganda. Bias in the media has become less of an opinion and more of an obstacle for the rest of us to work around to find the truth. And although it can be cathartic to shout things like fake news, there needs to be a follow-up. Exactly why is something fake news? You know, when I wrote that, what is the most important piece of political journalism in 2016, an establishment uh, Republican's guide to the alt-right, um, uh, you know, with Alan Bakari at Breitbart last year, and I said, the, I, I define the alt-right as it was emerging as this very broad coalition of mischievous, dissident, you know, kind of, uh, like, basically the Generation Trump, that bit of the, the Republican Party that had split off. Well, since then, some elements within the alt-right and some journalists redefined to me neo-Nazi. Yet people insist on calling me a neo-Nazi, you know, a gay Jew immigrant with a black fiance. I mean, do you think, do you think it's reasonable to call me alt-right, given that alt-right is now Anonymous with with um, with neo Nazi. Do you think it's reasonable? Do you think it's right? Do you think you should be doing it? Just stop. It's ridiculous. It's used as a way to, to to undermine people, to insinuate that there's something nefarious or sinister. Actually, even even the New Yorker of all places said that I don't hold any views that are not respectable, reason you know, re reasonable conservative mainstream views. I'm just more provocative with it. You see, one of the things that people do is they'll say extreme about conservatives as a way to kind of imply there's something nefarious or dangerous. She gets it too. Um, well, actually, what extreme means is a leftist thinks you're. In the 1890s, a Russian physiologist by the name of Ivan Pavlov was testing the possibility of classical conditioning in dogs. Pavlov was able to create a certain response from his dogs by linking a neutral stimulus, a bell, with a non-neutral stimulus food. Obviously, the dogs don't care about the bell, but they do care about the food. They only reacted to the bell when they got food every time it rang. We have a similar relationship with words. Writers often use that fact to manipulate the reader's emotions, and Rich Johnston is no exception. For example, let's look at the title. In the article, Richard Mare gets plenty of attention, Antarctic Press gets plenty of attention, and Jawbreakers, well, only gets a mention, but I'll address that in a moment. No Enemy But Peace, however, makes up the first four words in the title, but the very first paragraph is the only time the comic is referenced in the entire article. And notice there's no mention of Sergeant Martinez, nor anywhere are the reasons behind Mare's comic even explored. So again, why would Johnston use the title so prominently if he's not going to talk about the comic? Easy, because the words No Enemy But Peace are the exact words Johnston needed to set the scene. The goal in Johnston's article is to convince his readers that Richard Mayer is nothing but a bigot, a harasser, a devious villain who used hate to amass a fanbase of bitter Nazis. 
Imagine you're a third party getting your information about the Jawbreakers incident from Bleeding Cool. The first paragraph tells you that this evil man behind Jawbreakers, this internet supervillain, began his journey into comics with a work called No Enemy but peace. Without context, this fits right into Johnston's hands. Of course, the Cobra Commander of Comics would begin his unholy crusade by declaring that peace is his only enemy. Need more convincing of Johnston's biased and deceptive wording? Of course you do, and I'm more than happy to oblige. The work is saturated with examples. So saturated, in fact, that we don't even have to leave the first paragraph. The line, he was a fighter and artist struggling to work professionally in the comics industry, would be fine on its own, but paired with the biased nature of the article, it gives Mayer the somewhat villainous motivation of lashing out against established comic pros in a ruthless campaign of revenge. The line becomes especially deceptive if you consider the original Kickstarter alluded to in this article gave no indication that Mayer wanted to break into the comic books industry at all. In fact, the reason behind the comic is stated directly on the page. And I quote, Shortly after the battle, when my friends who had been in the thick of the fight told me of the heroics of Martinez, Tardif, and the others, I was shocked, astounded, and deeply proud to be in the company of these marines. When I returned to the States after finishing my deployment to Iraq, I was equally shocked and astounded that no one had heard of the incredible bravery exhibited that day. To the rest of the world, it was as if the battle simply never happened. But bravery matters. Loyalty matters. Tales like this should not be forgotten. Does any of that sound like Mayer was interested in entering the comic books industry? And the Kickstarter, along with the later reference to his first Jawbreakers crowdfunding campaign, stand as the only evidence to that claim. But by telling us this 2012 Kickstarter was Mayer's attempt to work professionally in the industry, when there was no definitive evidence to hint that at all, Johnston easily set the foundation for the narrative he needed to construct. That Richard Mayer is a hostile, bitter comics reject who used his need for revenge to amass a fanbase of evil minions. Oh, and don't think I've forgotten about the comics themselves, though Johnston obviously did. Or did he? One thing you'll notice in Johnston's article is although he mentions the comics, he doesn't touch on the substance. The heartfelt story behind the creation of No Enemy But Peace is non-existent. Instead, it's just the Kickstarter Mayor once did. And for those of you not in the know, Jawbreakers was not marketed as an anti-SJW comic. It was sold as a fun story that promised action, thrills, and to be absent of modern politics. No saccharine soliloquies to bore you to tears. But in Rich Johnston's article about the Jawbreakers incident, the only thing he says about the comic is that Jawbreakers is a military superhero comic. And that's not even true. Jawbreakers is about a bunch of ex-superheroes turned mercenaries. The military has nothing to do with it. Oh, and if you think I'm being too pedantic here, Jawbreakers essentially has the same premise as Suicide Squad or Secret Six. I wouldn't exactly call those military comics either. But in the diseased mind of a social justice warrior, military equals conservative and conservative equals bad. But why only give the blandest of mentions to Mayer's works? We know Johnson's not being objective. An objective article would at least give reference to Sergeant Martinez or the marketed pulse-pounding adventure of Jawbreakers. Just one line each would have done the trick. In fact, I'll show you right now. The project called No Enemy But Peace was Mayer's attempt to tell the true story of one Sergeant Martinez during his firefight in Iraq. The event had earned him the Navy Cross. The campaign seemed to go well enough, raising over $4,000 from over 100 people. And... Jawbreakers is a superhero comic that was marketed as a fun, action-packed adventure for everyone while promising to be absent of modern politics. It's to be drawn by well-known comic book artist John Malin, with covers by Ethan Van Skyver and colors by Brett Smith. See? Easy. So why didn't he do it? After all, Jawbreakers Lost Souls is kind of at the center of the whole affair. You'd think a comics journalist writing an article about a comic that caused such huge waves would at least talk about the comic. Well, if Johnston told his readers that the dastardly Richard C. Mayer created no enemy but peace not to enter the comic books industry, but to tell the story of a brother in arms so his tale of bravery and redemption would be remembered, and that his Jawbreakers comic is not a hate-filled loony bin, but a fun, high-octane action thriller, then some people 
might sympathize with him, maybe even identify with what Mayer is trying to accomplish. But since this article is propaganda, objectivity is a big no-no, and allowing Mayer to be painted in a good light in any way is completely out of the question. So, knowing that, it's no wonder Rich Johnson decided not to actually talk about Richard Mayer's comics in an article about Richard Mayer's comics. However, all that pales in comparison to what really shatters all pretense of objectivity and what truly makes this article a pathetic work of worthless garbage. Spreading fear and doubt is a method used to sway public opinion against someone by offering negative or even false information. The goal here is to undermine the target's beliefs. Seeing as how this article is presented as journalism, Johnston relies more on spreading negative information in order to undermine both the character of the Jawbreaker's crew and the titanic nature of their success. We start off with Johnston naming off the Jawbreaker's crew, and it's fine until the very last line. It was his second attempt to crowdfund a comic, but this time, he had star status and supposed to buy big names, undermining the colossal success by implying that the big numbers attracted by the Jawbreakers comic was only possible because John Malin, Brett Smith, and Ethan Van Skyver brought along their fan bases. Then Johnston really gets started. First, he says Richard C. Mayer is a hateful man who runs a hateful YouTube channel where he makes video after video throwing insults at progressive comic creators. Then, after telling his readers about how toxic diversity in comics is, he tells his readers that John Malin and Ethan Van Skyver were outcasts from the comics community for attacking other employees, making them sound like unhinged madmen, which undermines the good nature of the project. Let's keep in mind that Ethan Van Skyver may have agreed to create a cover for Jawbreakers, but he isn't a core member of the Jawbreakers crew. So it's pretty clear why Johnston chose to include Van Skyver as if he were. That way, he could link the dirt he collected on Van Skyver to Jawbreakers, further undermining their goodwill. So by this time, it seems like the comic books industry's newest, most powerful villain, Richard C. Mayer, has begun to form his own Legion of Doom, forming alliances with other supposed industry villains who they thought defeated. Sorry, ostracized. Next, the article makes sure to inform the reader that the large number of backers and the huge amount of cash was due in part to people pledging repeatedly for multiple copies, and that this was done in an effort to beat two other crowdfunded works, Black and Leaving Megalopolis by Gail Simone, information presented to both undermine Mayer's success and to link back to Johnson's proposed narrative that Jawbreakers was fueled by hate and bigotry. Huge sections from a video called The Dark Roast, where Mayer tries a dirtier version of his usual mockery of the Marvel Mafia, are also included. Johnston makes certain to preface this as a harsh listen, and bolsters it with the untrue statement that roasts are usually done with the consent of those being roasted, either playing a petty game of semantics, or Johnston is a man who's never been on the internet before. Then enters our hero, Mark Wade. The article presents Wade as the understanding party, the man who once tried to make peace with the vile Richard C. Mayer, but was rejected, helping to support Rich Johnston's suggestion that Richard C. Mayer is a spiteful villain who truly has no enemy but peace. Now comes the biggest crack in Johnston's thin veneer of objectivity. The article addresses Mark Wade's involvement in convincing Antarctic Press to pull Jawbreakers from its lineup by interviewing Wade, which basically amounted to Wade investigating himself and finding that he did nothing wrong. And, because Johnston is apparently one of those people who listens and believes, he apparently listened to Wade's story and said, Cha, that's good enough for me. Because despite Johnston having a clear line of communication with Mayer through Twitter, and Mayer showing willingness to engage with Johnston, at no point in the article is there an interview with Mayer, where he's allowed to give his side of the story. Johnston got a direct quote from pretty much everyone remotely connected to the event, except the people at the center of it. A work of legit journalism? Please. Journalism is a search for truth. Presenting only one side of the story when you have clear access to the other side would only seem like legit reporting under communism or CNN. 
Now, it should be noted that Johnston does link articles to some of his claims, like their coverage on No Enemy But Peace in the ostracization of Ethan Van Skyver. It should also be noted that these links lead to other Bleeding Cool articles also written by Rich Johnston, but even if they were 100% legitimate accounts of what happened, it still doesn't save his face of objectivity. Why? Because this is the same trick companies use when they present you with a 30-day free trial, as long as you provide your credit card information first. They're banking that most people will forget to cancel before the trial is up. People are reading this one article for the whole story. How many do you think are realistically going to dig through several articles for the big picture? And how many do you think are just going to take Johnston's word for it? If this article was truly objective, wouldn't there be at least a sentence summarizing these topics? For example, Ethan Van Skyver was ostracized from the comics community after a particularly heated exchange on social media with his fellow comic book professionals, exemplifying his notorious mean streak. That way, the reader gets a little more context than Ethan Van Skyver attacks people, rendering further exploration optional rather than mandatory. Deceptive wording, being intentionally vague, spreading fear and doubt by undermining the character of the Jawbreaker's crew, belittling their monumental success, and intentionally giving bleeding cool readers only half the story. In the end, Johnson's article is not a summary of truth, but a collection of facts twisted into a fabrication, a brand new lie, ready to be told a thousand times. Thousand times.